Radio Play Comics is meant to adapt the stories mostly of great unadapted old and forgotten comics from the past. I use voice acting and narration to abridge the work as much as possible without lessening its impact and to bring these stories to life the best way I can. Please enjoy. Hi, I'm Nick, and welcome to the Fusion Space for today's episode of Radio Play Comics, Mike Grell's Green Arrow 4, Broken Arrow. This is the fifth video total in my adaptation of Mike Grell's run of Green Arrow, which began in 1988 with the miniseries The Longbow Hunter, and I've continued in eight-issue increments from there. Oliver Queen has settled into his new life as Seattle's street-level guardian, taking down human foes such as drug pushers, murderers, and smugglers rather than supervillains, while the book tackles real-life issues such as growing older and trying to find your place in a world that's changing around you, the morality of crime, punishment, and vigilante justice, love and loss in the hero profession, and dealing with psychological trauma. This episode is going to be more along the lines of the latter than the former, as it's a little light on action and adventure, but the other episodes, especially those featuring Shado, more than make up for it. So keep the context in mind, and I hope it will be no less entertaining because of the greater focus on drama. And also know that it is all-important setup for a large action-packed adventure which will form half of the next episode, and that adventure will set the course of Oliver's life for some time to come. I'll describe it more in the outro when we get there, to give this story a proper wrap-up as it will end in a cliffhanger, as comic stories often would, just to keep people buying that essential next issue. Though now that I mention it, I do hope you come back for the next episode. I usually structure these to stand alone as best they can. This two-parter will be a rarity, but it also contains the run's single biggest turning point. If you've seen any of my videos which relate the death of Green Arrow, you'll know that Oliver ends his life having been on the run from the government with a history of both working for them and being screwed over by them, and the big adventure I'm talking about is when that pattern is first introduced, and it would return several times throughout the run. Before this point, most superheroes generally only were involved with the government in public ways, Superman being asked to stop an asteroid and the like, but with Oliver, the more hidden elements of the government saw an opportunity to utilize a secret agent because he had already involved himself in their world. Such as when he worked for the Russians in the story of the Champions, retrieving and then destroying a biological weapon while in competition with Eddie Fires, who was working for the Chinese, and working for CIA agent Greg Osborne when he was hunting Shado in a map to hidden gold she had taken in Here There Be Dragons. Oliver was just powerful enough to be useful to them, and powerless enough to burn as an asset if need be and it finally takes its toll and changes his life forever. But all that is for the next episode. In this episode, Oliver will first have a run-in with another Mike Grell character, the Warlord, also known as Travis Morgan, who adventures in a hollow earth realm known as Scartaris and usually fights dinosaurs, dragons, wizards, and the like, in a setting that's lovingly reminiscent of Tarzan and Conan the Barbarian stories. It seems that Travis bears a striking resemblance to Oliver Queen, who has made enemies all over town, all of whom mistake Travis for him, and many of them end up at the point of his sword. Travis finds Oliver to hash it out with him, and ends up helping Oliver and Dinah defend their home during an attack by gangsters out for revenge on Green Arrow. It's a fun team-up for fans of both comics, as many had pointed out over time that the two characters bore a resemblance to each other, when in fact Warlord's look was based on Mike Grell himself when he created him in 1975. Of second is a sad story inspired by the real-life disaster of the Exxon Valdez, an oil tanker which caused a huge spill and long-running efforts to repair the damage to the environment. It was the first such incident that gained widespread attention and public outcry and eventually helped cause new safety policies in the oil industry to be developed. This story replicates the events with an extra layer of culpability laid at the corporation's feet, which the story disclaims as pure conjecture for legal reasons, but it echoes the public sentiment at the time. Oliver Queen sets out to track down the ship's captain, placed in hiding by the oil company, while most of the story is narrated by a coyote, serving as the voice of the natural world. The third story concerns increased drug and gang activity in neighborhoods where families live, leading to open threats against them, and some of the neighbors who decide to fight back with weapons of their own, having previously served in the military. Green Arrow eventually decides to get involved, having dealt with this particular gang leader before, way back in The Gauntlet, in the first proper episode, Hunter's Moon. However, he's bitten off more than he can chew this time, and it will be up to Dinah as Black Canary to rescue him with guns blazing. Following that, our fourth and final story sees Oliver visit another character from the very first issue, the therapist Annie Green, to deal with his own trauma from being kidnapped and tortured, just as she helped Dinah through her own after her capture in the Longbow Hunters. Oliver sets himself to rights enough to get back in uniform and go on a revenge quest in this episode's climax, 
striking at the heart of the drug smuggling operation on foreign soil, with help from yet another old friend, Eddie Fires. But has Eddie only set Oliver up for an even larger fall? That cliffhanger will carry on to the next episode. This is a slow period for the book, which is itself a feature of being an experimental mature reader's title. The book would often focus on Oliver's relationships and inner life in response to events around him, and the pace is a huge departure from most superhero comics of the time, where it seems like big events are lined up one after another and a new disaster is always looming over the horizon. Instead, this book tried to replicate the feeling of a real person's life passing and a real character growing as things change him, just as they do for all of us. In this way, I find that it makes even the concept of a superhero more relatable, more human. So now, without further ado, let's begin. Any kid can tell you, you can't judge how deep a puddle is by looking at it from the top. Sometimes you have to get right in and wade through it to find out what's really at the bottom. Two punks notice a man in a bar with a rucksack wearing a large overcoat. It's him, man. I'd know that bastard anywhere. Hey, man, remember me? I've got a little reminder of our first meeting. Remember this asshole? The lead punk shows the man his scarred palm. I did 18 months on account of you and your Robin Hood routine. Now I'm going to give you something to remember me by. The attacker pulls a knife. Ching. Hey, hey. I don't want any trouble in here. The man in the coat blocks his stab. Yes. Then flips the punk over while taking the knife. <laughs> and sticks it through his scarred palm, pinning him to the bar. Ah! No trouble. The stranger walks away. Meanwhile, Green Arrow returns home after a fight in the pouring rain. They call this the Evergreen State. Three guesses why. Hint number one. The state animal is a slug. Hint number two. The state bird is a flying fish. Hint number three. And the state flower is mildew. <sighs> One good thing about the rain. It washes away the blood. Back at home, Dinah bandages his arm. You're getting pretty good at this. Practice makes perfect. What you mean is, I'm getting too old for this. What I mean is, you're just like me. Old enough to know better, but too stubborn to quit. Let's hear it for juvenile irresponsibility. Hip, hip. How come you hardly ever get hit? Because I remember to duck. Oh, I see. Maybe you think you've got a thing or two to teach me. Sure. Come downstairs. You know what they say about old dogs. Yes, but if I could at least housebreak you, that would be something. Let me guess. I forgot to put the lid down again. The man in the overcoat walks in the rain when he is greeted by an inviting voice. Hi, baby. Want a party? Party? Yeah, you know. Party! I'm afraid I don't. Screw! Oh. No thanks. But I do appreciate the offer. Seems like this town is friendlier than I thought. Ah! Oh, very! He walks away and is then greeted by a far less inviting voice. Look who's here! Four thugs ready their weapons as they surround him. Just in time for a little batting practice. A lot of guys got you figured for some kind of hot shot, but not me. The lead thug raises his bat as his target reaches into a long case on his back. I figure you for me! As the bat comes down, the stranger meets its swing, and suddenly the thug is holding the chopped hilt of a bat. Huh? The thugs all run away. No! <laughs> Oliver lies down on his back. <sighs> that was pretty good. Let's do that again. You're a glutton for punishment. Dinah helps him off the mat in her karate gi. You got lucky. That helps him right back down again with a classic judo toss. <sighs> and gets atop him. No fair. I wasn't ready. They kiss. Mm. Okay. Now I am. Enter. A stranger walks over a bridge in the rain when a car pulls up beside him and four men get out. <clears throat> Looks like a lucky night, except for you. I've got something that belongs to you. The man pulls out a bloody arrow and throws it at the stranger, who catches it. <sighs> I thought you'd have the sense to know when to back off, but I guess I thought wrong. 
That little incident tonight is not the kind of thing that we can just let happen. <sighs> Benny was a worm, but he was my worm in law. Somebody has to pay. Somebody has to be an example, so others don't get the idea they can just do as they please. I'm afraid there are rules, and you broke a whole bunch. I want he should splatter when he lands. I don't think this is the same guy, Eddie. Come on, how many guys in this town look like that? The men surround him at the edge, and one pulls out his gun. Okay, chump, let's do this the easy way. Jump! Hey, Eddie, I think Hugo's right. This isn't. The stranger grabs the man's hand and yanks it behind himself, making him shoot Hugo. <laughs> he slams the man's arm into his knee, and he drops his gun. <laughs> Another man begins to draw, but the stranger throws the bloody arrow at him before he can fire, piercing his throat. <laughs> Lightning crashes as the stranger leaps into action, knocking the men away like a wild animal. <laughs> <laughs> As he punches another on the ground, the two remaining men get back in the car. <laughs> this definitely ain't the same guy, Eddie. Get in the car. I'll show you how to handle this son of a bitch. He reaches into his pack as the car bears down on him. <clears throat> Die, mother! The stranger draws a huge gun and fires. <laughs> the car rolls to a stop. <laughs> you shot my car? You shot my car? Up until now, I was only irritated. But you people are starting to piss me off. The stranger lifts the driver's chin with his gun barrel. Now, let's have a nice little chat. Oliver awakens to a knocking on his door. I'm coming, I'm coming. A knocking that only grows more insistent. For crying out loud, hold your horse. He opens the door. Hey, you look just like so I hear. From about half the population of Seattle, who all want you dead. Whatever you've been doing to piss these people off. The stranger decks Ollie. <laughs> Cut it out. Continued next month. Later, the gangsters regroup in an office building. Their leader is even more intent on his revenge after the incident on the bridge, and makes plans to assault Oliver and Dinah's home. But first, they'll need a diversion to distract the cops in their area. Meanwhile, Oliver regroups on his floor. Ah. Uh, huh? Siege. What the hell is going on here? You stay out of this, little lady. I've been in this town 24 hours, and so far I've been dodging knives, clubs, guns, goons, and cars, and it's his fault. This is my home, Buster. Then why don't you go back to the kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> Dinah slugs him before he can finish. The stranger joins Ollie on the floor. I could have warned you about that. Damn, I'm getting tired of being knocked down by a woman. Does it happen to you often? Only when I go home. Can't figure out exactly what it is. But I must be doing something wrong. Ma'am, I apologize for being out of line. But you really should have a word with this guy about putting a limit on his enemies. He got about half of Seattle wanting to kill him. I'll think about it. This is Dinah Lands, and I'm Oliver Queen. Hell, I know that. People on the street told me all about you. Took me almost a, whatchamacallit, hour to locate you. What's your name? Morgan. Morgan what? The Raider. <laughs> Haven't used that one in a while. Looks like you've been traveling. Where are you from? You wouldn't believe me if I told you, Sonny. Sonny? You two could be brothers. Even twins. Sure, except one of us is a lot shorter. Fatter. Balder. Uglier. Well, some people obviously have a great deal of trouble telling you apart. The beard and mustache help some. And we are about the same age. <laughs> That's a funny one. Unless you were born in 1926. That's impossible. You don't look a day over 50. I try to stay active. And nothing is impossible. Trust me. Dinah pours them all coffee in the kitchen. What do you do, Morgan? I suppose you could say I'm a military man. Air Force. Used to be. Retired? Well, once upon a time. When you were probably trying to stay in school and avoid the draft for just a little while longer. I was a pilot. Not just any pilot. 
hush-hush kind of stuff. Anyway, I got myself shot up over Russia and wound up bailing out. According to today's paper, that was over 20 years ago. Strange how you lose track. What happened? Well, let's just say time flies when you're having fun. Finally, I just started walking, hit Alaska in January, and hitched a ride on an Air Force transport. I suppose the curiosity got to me more than anything. I wanted to see what the world had done to itself in 20 years. And? I'm not surprised. I just thought we might have learned something. Some things are better. Some are worse. People haven't changed much. Still fighting over nothing. I kind of wonder, what happened to all those bright kids who were going to change the world? Maybe they didn't care enough after all. <sighs> all in all, I think I would have been better off staying put. The head gangster has called in all the help he can. He tells the men there will be a blackout in the city tonight, and to steal and cause as much loud chaos as they can, anywhere but Ollie's street. What have you been doing until now? Traveling. Having a look at the country. Seeing how things have changed. More women are working now, which is fine. And more men are wearing earrings, which is... weird. Liberal has become a dirty word. But at least Teddy Kennedy never got to be president indicating the country hasn't totally lost its mind. Except that doesn't exactly explain Ronald Reagan. Somebody should have told him there's more to being president than remembering your lines and not bumping into the furniture. Did you know Elvis Presley is dead? And Ricky Nelson, Bing Crosby, Jack Benny, John Wayne. And most of what I knew. Tradition. Values. I hear we lost that stupid war. Hell, I could have told them that was coming. A van pulls up to an electrical station and a team of men get out. <laughs> they take out the guard and cut through a chain. <laughs> Soon planting an explosive in a high voltage area. <laughs> Do you have a place to stay? Stay? Honey, I never stay. Ask Tara. Is she your wife? I don't know what you'd call her these days. But she sure as hell isn't a wife. The explosives go off. <clears throat> Do you have a family? Got a daughter somewhere. But she does pretty well on her own. The power goes out. Now what? What do you expect? The power company has a name that sounds like whoops. During the blackout, people are attacked, buildings are bombed, and emergency vehicles rush out to help all over a large area of the city. <laughs> This whole end of town is blacked out. Looks like a couple of fires, too. I don't mind the dark. It's a nice switch. Where I come from, the sun shines all the time. You'll have to excuse us if we don't feel too sorry for you. Try getting used to 167 days of rain per year. <laughs> That's not exactly what I meant. It's just that there's something about the night. I had forgotten. A van and a car pull up to Sherwood Florist. <clears throat> Nobody gets out alive. A team of heavily armed men head for the building. <coughs> Tried to file for back pay, but Uncle Sam wants to know a whole lot of things about where you were for 20 years. I don't think they liked my answers, because they didn't give me the money. And they started asking a whole lot more questions. Finally, I said to hell with it and decided to go back. To Russia? To home. The only one I have anymore. I figure with a little luck, I'll make it by spring. Of course, you can't tell spring from fall there. It all pretty much runs together and you lose track. One of the team knocks over a trash can. <laughs> Do you have a cat? No. Then you got rats. Big ones. Looks like company. Oliver readies his bow and quiver. How long you been in Seattle? Couple of years. Why? I've got to admire a man who makes this many enemies in such a short time. Phone's dead. We're on our own. Morgan, this isn't your fight. You better stay out of it. Travis readies his large handgun. Huh. <laughs> and miss all the fun? Three men fire into the door. <laughs> Ollie and Travis return fire from the windows above them, taking out two of them. Travis runs onto the roof as the third man shoots back at them. 
Two more men crash through the window, finding Dinah. She karate kicks one, and he drops his machine gun. She kicks the other man, who drops his Uzi. Just as he picks it up, Oliver shoots an arrow through his gun arm from the stair. Out on the roof, Travis fires back through a hail of bullets, impacting all around it. A man in the yard launches a shoulder-mounted rocket into the roof, and Travis is thrown by the explosion. Morgan! There's nothing you can do for him. Fall back to the tower. Gunmen fill the hallway as Oliver fires while retreating. <laughs> Dinah takes one down with the Uzi. <laughs> Bullets smash through the window next to Ollie. <laughs> he leans out the window and takes down another in the yard next to the leader. <laughs> Travis climbs from the rubble as more men stream inside. <laughs> I'm empty. Me too. The Warlord picks up his sword. Shing. He leaps into the men, grabbing one's neck with one arm and stomping another's head while slashing into a third. <laughs> nice quiet little town you folks have got here. Look! The leader gets into his car to escape. Eddie Finster! I could have guessed he was behind this. Travis jumps down into the car's path and Eddie guns it. <laughs> What are you gonna do without your gun, wise ass? The warlord dodges the car while swinging his sword through the windshield, the door frame, and Eddie's neck. If you folks don't mind, I don't think I'll stick around for the questions that are going to come out of this. I understand, Morgan. Good luck. And thank you, even if my house will never be the same. There is one question I'd like to have answered, though. Did Gilligan ever get off that island? Epilogue. The police come to inspect the scene. So this guy just disappears, right? Not exactly. Then where the hell did he go? Well, he did leave an address. Sort of. Alright, let's have it. Ollie and Dinah look wistfully into the sky. Second star to the right. And straight on till morning. Huh. <laughs> This is my tale. Believe none of it unless you have seen with your own eyes. For I am Coyote, the trickster, and I have been known to lie. Spring has called Old Bear from his den. The hunger from his long sleep is upon him, and he knows the place where the water people go to breed and die. In weeks to come the streams will run red with their bodies shimmering in the sun. For a time they will come together in the urgency of an age-old cycle, and when they have passed the way of all things, their spawn will be left to continue the spiral dance. There will be much to eat, and he will soon regain his strength for the breeding season ahead when he will pass his seed on to another generation of his own tribe. This is the way of all the people. Life from death. Death from life. The earth is the mother of us all. You cannot own it. You are part of it. Only man among all the creatures has forgotten. The bear rears up in alarm at the scene before him. Huh? The oil tanker, the Argon warrior, has run aground on a rock, spilling oil into the water and covering the seagulls in it. Coyote tears. A disclaimer reads, This story was inspired by the recent devastating oil spill in Alaska from a stranded oil tanker, and on the charges that the captain of the tanker was legally drunk at the time of the incident. However, the reader should understand that this story is a work of fiction, and that the creators have used their literary license to embellish the bare-bones facts with wholly imaginary details such as the goings-on at the oil company. An executive from Argonne Oil fields angry questions from reporters, claiming the company is working within EPA guidelines on the cleanup effort. He denies the reports of oil-soaked sea otters, until Greenpeace activists dump a trash can filled with them onto the stage. <laughs> you got to get me out of here, Mr. Chandler. And just where the hell are you going to go, Springsteen? They'll be watching every airport and private field in the world. The state is thinking about charges of criminal negligence. 
The Coast Guard is convinced you must have been drunk when the ship ran aground. That mob is looking for someone to hang for all this. And everyone from Greenpeace to the Cub Scouts is ready to hold the rope. You set foot out that door, and you're a dead man. <sighs> you don't seem too popular yourself, Chandler. If they come in here, what makes you so sure they'll stop with me? Corbett still has that lodge on Two Moons Lake, north of Denali. That should do until things quiet down. Meanwhile, we can see where this thing is going. I mean, he could be a bargaining chip if we need to throw them someone. And this would keep him from striking any private bargains. Hmm. Get your gear, Lou. You're going fishing for a few days. Before the thing crawled across the land, the people of the tundra were numberless. Their tribe would stretch from rising to setting of the sun as they followed the ancient path with the changing seasons. But the thing blocked the path, and the people lost their way. The circle was broken. The migrating deer find their path blocked by an oil pipeline. And my dog brothers, who had followed the people of horn and hoof, and filled the long night with a chorus of their cries were lost. For we are one, all children of the earth, and that which diminishes one, diminishes all. The coyotes find that their food source has run out. <coughs> a small prop plane has delivered the ship's captain to the cabin in the woods. Just don't forget where this place is. I mean... You wouldn't leave me up here or anything. Quit whining, Springsteen. You've got plenty of food and booze. Just sit tight until this thing blows over. We'll see you in a few days. A week at the outside. <laughs> huh? He reacts to a sound in the forest with fear, hurries inside, and bars the door. <sighs> <sighs> Selecting a rifle, he sits in a chair and waits. The Seattle Times headline reads, FBI joins search for fugitive sea captain, skipper of ill-fated Argonne warrior missing second week. Alaskans receive oil company payoff profits? Ollie angrily crumples it. <sighs> Oliver? And he begins to pack. Where are you going? Hunting. As rescue efforts continue, the number of deaths among wildlife rises daily. Sea otters, whose fur becomes matted and loses its insulating quality, often die of the cold, despite efforts of volunteer cleanup crews. Mothers attempting to lick their pups clean are poisoned by the oil, and even if brought in, are frequently beyond help. Bald eagles feeding on the oiled carcasses washed ashore are dying as well. And another danger has appeared. Bears, awakening from the winter's hibernation, are attracted by the rotting carcasses on the beaches and have come looking for an easy meal. It is not known how susceptible these great carnivores are to the toxic effects of the oil, but their presence poses a danger to clean-up crews. A worker shoots a large bear chasing a man, and it falls. <laughs> <laughs> So far, there have been no serious encounters, but it seems just a matter of time. I wonder if Old Bear would consider this serious. Meanwhile, David Chandler, spokesman for Argon Oil, had this to say regarding the disappearance of the captain of the Argon Warrior, now being sought on a federal warrant. As I told the FBI, we have had no contact with Captain Springsteen since his disappearance. We are as much in the dark as anyone is to his whereabouts, but we are confident that he will surface to defend himself against these charges. Bullshit. You ask me, there's the bastard they should hang, just on principle. Ruin the whole damn season. Didn't I read somewhere that Chandler is an avid fisherman himself? Even put a few trout in the record book. Huh. <laughs> Big hairy goddamn deal. Argon's got two moons all to themselves. If they let anyone else on their private reserve, you'd see a lot of records come out of that lake. Bastards have probably got it stocked anyway. Oliver's face fixes with grim determination. Hmm. Soon it is Green Arrow who stalks the forest path near the reserved lake, unaware that he himself is being watched. A hunter? I've seen his kind before, yet I do not understand them. This one moves well, 
silent, watchful, but he heeds not the message of the wind, the scent of the people within easy reach of the death he carries. We are brothers in a fashion, but different. Oliver notices the coyote on a ridge following him. Only man killed without need makes war on his own kind. He pulls out an arrow and knocks it. Even in the heat of the mating moon, the people are content with a show of strength. There are perils enough without the foolishness of war. What brings him here, far from his tribe? Can he not smell the storm on the wind? Here in the high country, spring can be a false promise hiding much danger. After gaining some elevation, Green Arrow finally sees the lake. For all their strutting and posturing, men are frail creatures, ill-equipped to withstand the fury of nature. Perhaps that is why they try to bend the earth to their will, the fear. But there is no fear in this one, not like the other. The coyote draws closer to Oliver as he tracks his quarry. What is it that he hunts? Can it be? Yes, he finds the cabin. Now we shall see, and kicks the door open. <laughs> Perhaps we shall learn. <laughs> Hear me, children of the earth. I have a tale. Believe if you will, but beware. For there are lies in truth, and truth in lies. And I am Coyote, the trickster, and I tell both with equal ease. With temporary hull repairs complete, stricken tanker Argon Warrior, which ran aground off Alaska's coast two weeks ago, is ready to be towed to dry dock for extensive reconstruction. However, the owners, Argon Oil Company, have been unable to find a port facility that will accept the stricken vessel. The ship which caused the worst oil spill disaster in history may become a modern-day flying Dutchman, wandering forever in search of a friendly port. A bald eagle carries away an oily fish as the cleanup continues. <sighs> The bastard! It's two weeks, Paul. We'd better go get him. Let him rot up there for all I care. We can't. Now his absence is making us look bad. Like we're hiding him out. I got word the lodge is in for a hell of a storm. When it blows over, we can fly up and get him. Take him straight into Canada, and then down to D.C. Okay. I'll have legal and promotions write a statement for when we turn him over. Promotions? Hey, they've done a hell of a job. Wait till you see what we're going to drop on the media tomorrow. It'll give the ecology freaks a conniption. The hunter has come. I often wonder at the simple savagery of a beast that turns on its own kind. They do not eat one another, nor use the skins for leather. They have no practical use for a dead member of their tribe. The joy seems to be purely in the killing. Coyote Tears, Part 2 Green Arrow kicks open the cabin door with an arrow drawn, surprising the captain inside. <laughs> ah! He aims his gun at the door as he rises, but Oliver does not shoot, seeing the blind panic in his eyes. Ah! <sighs> Are you crazy? You let him in! The captain rushes past Ollie to slam the door shut. Ah! <laughs> let who in? Him! He's out there. Can't you hear him? Christ, are you deaf? Listen! I don't hear anything but the wind. And a coyote. Outside, the coyote howls at the moon, and the sound pierces the man to his core with fright. He collapses against the wall, desperately clutching his rifle. He's been there every day, every night. He doesn't do anything, just watches and waits. I shot at him at first, but he's not like the others. 
He won't die. You're not from the company, are you? No. I've come to take you back. Yes, of course. Please, you got to get me out of here. We're not going anywhere until this storm is over. Uh, how long? A day or two. A day? Or two? Meanwhile, the executives of Argon Oil discuss their business strategy. The others will never go along with it. It doesn't matter, as long as we make the offer. What if? Just what if they take us up on it? That's the beauty of it. The damn thing is already paid for, but it still costs us to maintain it, right? So? So now the new owners will have to operate and maintain it, and they're not qualified or equipped to do either. After a few weeks of disaster, who do you think they're going to come to for help? Which we will gladly provide. For a fee. We get paid for doing what we've been doing all along anyway. And we come out smelling like a rose. I think it may even be deductible. Huh. <laughs> I love this business. Before the thing spilled its blood, the waters were home to many, life to all. Now... It is death for all. A duck fails to take off from the oily surface of the water. <coughs> now the water people and the sky people, drawn by age-old instincts, taste the blackness. It crawls onto the rocks as the bald eagle swoops down. <coughs> from the smallest to the greatest, it strikes all. The eagle snatches it up, breaking the duck's neck with its talons and tearing out a chunk of meat with its beak. <laughs> For the great live on the small, and the loss of one diminishes the other. Snow piles up around the cabin as the storm rages on. You don't hear it, do you? I didn't either. Not at first. But then, it started. First it was small, so small you'd never notice. And then, it got bigger. The screams, the cries, and now this, this moaning. Do you know what it is? I do. It's dying. Outside, the bears are forced to fight over the diminished food supply in the clean areas, while the gulls wait to scavenge the leftovers. <laughs> no, it was murdered. Two men paint the side of a ship. And so, ladies and gentlemen, in the wake of this terrible tragedy, the Argonne Oil Company is asking the other members of the Alaskan Pipeline Corporation to join us in an effort to ensure that such a tragedy never happens again. To that end, Argonne Oil proposes that we give the Alaska Pipeline to the Native American Indians whose land it crosses, and whose tradition of harmony with the earth will enable them to manage the resources of this great land for the betterment of all people. Huh? The executives celebrate backstage. <laughs> Two more men ready a ladder at an Argon gas station. Who are you to judge me? You weren't there. You don't know. I'm not going to be your judge, Springsteen. But you will answer for what happened. Answer? What the hell do you think I've been doing? You want me to stand trial? What's that going to prove? Nothing. Because our lawyers can lick your lawyers. They begin taking down the sign's letters. Oh, sure. I'm going to take a fall for this. But not a very big one. Know why? Because the company can't afford to have it look like it was too much their fault. If it takes a billion dollars, so what? The storm over Two Moons Lake has lifted. Okay, let's go get him. And feed him to the sharks. As the executives leave, the Argon flag is lowered. The bald eagle, having fed her young, takes off from her nest, though the front of her body is now covered with oil. See, I know something people like you never seem to grasp. They don't have to play by the rules. They can change them as they go along. In a little while, none of this will have happened. The eagle coughs and falters in her flight. <coughs> it won't make one bit of difference. 
You're sure no one knows about this? Hey, boss, I didn't even talk to my wife. No one knows where he is but the three of us. The Argon executives board their prop plane and take off. <laughs> Storm's gone. They'll be coming for me soon. I think I liked you better crazy. The plane flies through the clear sky. <laughs> Cabin fever, that's all. The spirit of my sky brother flies on the wind. Coyote sees the bald eagle falling like a stone, like judgment, descending like the hammer of the gods. Ah. <laughs> the captain leans out the door and fires blind in his panic, just as the eagle's body smashes into the prop plane's cockpit window. <laughs> hey, wait! Where did you... The plane crashes into a mountain and explodes in a huge fireball. <laughs> it's okay. It doesn't matter. They'll be coming for me soon. Over the ring of his gunshot, the captain seems not to have heard it. Green Arrow leaves him there to await whatever fate lies in store for him. This is the end of my tale. But, of course, it never happened. A man pumps gas at the newly branded Argos gas station, while the oil tanker the Argos Voyager sets sail once more. The leader of the local neighborhood watch is holding a barbecue. A young girl runs and plays as families enjoy the food and company. Then the man is alarmed when a flashy car approaches. Mm hmm? Huh? Gang members inside the car drive by, miming guns with their hands and making gun sounds as a warning. Blair, Blair, Blair! The grill is knocked over as the people dive for cover. <laughs> Slowly they rise, realizing there were no bullets. This time. Maybe we better all go inside. The canary is a bird of prey. Oliver and Dinah fly a kite in the park. It's not surprising so many Seattleites are sun worshippers. They see it so infrequently, they're bound to regard it with a certain amount of superstition. Do I detect a bit of sarcasm? Just being observant. While running, Ollie tumbles down a hill. <sighs> <laughs> I did that on purpose. You're not very good at this, mister. You must not have any kids, huh? Well, when the urge strikes, I go to the zoo and visit the monkey house until it passes. <laughs> <laughs> Dinah and Oliver share a glum look. Hmm. Hmm. The last time they discussed having children, Dinah said their lives were too dangerous, and while she loved to make babies with Oliver, she won't make orphans. Drive by again. I'm gonna give these dudes something to think about. The flashy car turns around in the alley. <laughs> the driver fires two shots into the house's wall. <laughs> Suddenly, four gun barrels break through the window panes. <laughs> and gunfire quickly fills the car, breaking its window. Holy shit! The gang fires blindly as their car speeds away. <laughs> Inside the house, the families lie on the floor while the ex-military men reload their guns, just in case. The police and a news crew have cordoned off an area around a rough homemade barricade outside the house. Early this afternoon, violence erupted in this troubled neighborhood when members of the Area Block Watch Association some of them off-duty National Guardsmen, exchanged more than a hundred rounds of gunfire with a carload of alleged drug dealers. The home of Block Watch leader James Elliott was struck by dozens of bullets, but there have been no reported injuries. Local residents blame the outbreak of violence on the increased drug trade in the area. This place used to be safe when me and my boy moved here two years ago, but now every night there's a stream of cars through here. 
looking for drugs. They sell crack out of the warehouses, and the cops don't do nothing. I counted 156 cars in one night stopped at that place over there. Fancy cars, uptown kids and yuppies. I took down license numbers. I called the cops night after night, and now they treat me like a nuisance. Police are trying to bring both sides to a negotiation in an effort to put an end to the siege. Negotiate? What the hell are you talking about? They expect us to negotiate with drug dealers? They're so worried about the rights of the criminals, they've forgotten the people. I'm not saying I'm a member of any gang. I'm just saying I'm here, and I'm gonna be here. If somebody wants to shoot at me while I'm standing out here, they better be ready for the consequences. At his day job, James Elliott gives his art students advice on drawing superheroes. As he ushers his students out the door, a boy in a red jacket sees a flashy car speeding towards them. Huh? Mm. Ah! The innocent students are brutally gunned down by the gang members in the car. <laughs> a 15-year-old boy shot to death and three of his friends wounded simply because one of them was wearing the wrong colors. Some residents believe this is an extension of the violence that broke out here yesterday. This is the kind of thing that happens when you let a place like that exist. You come down here any night. You can see them buying drugs right on the street. Police Lieutenant James Cameron had this to say. While we have eyewitness reports of people exchanging packets for money, we have no evidence these packets contain drugs. Unfortunately, in this case anyway, it is not illegal in the city of Seattle to exchange packets for money. Oliver kicks in his TV screen. <laughs> Oliver changes into Green Arrow while Dinah sleeps. <sighs> it's never going to go down with all this happening. Robinson is positive they're going ahead, sir. Think about it. Who'd suspect a major drug shipment would arrive in the middle of all this? You tell Robinson he's got one week. Then we go with what we've got. A lot can happen in a week. Tell me about it. We're sitting on a powder keg here. Lieutenant Cameron lights a cigarette. <laughs> Let's just hope no one strikes a match. He tosses away his match before a worried young girl. Green Arrow overlooks the warehouse district from a rooftop, preparing for the hunt. Hmm... He grimaces when he recognizes a certain limousine. <sighs> I should have known it would be you. Oliver follows the car to one of the warehouses and looks for an entrance on the roof. <sighs> Green Arrow enters through an air vent and sneaks along the rafters. He silently chokes out an armed guard on a high catwalk. <sighs> <sighs> positioning himself above the limo as it enters. <laughs> 200 kilos coming in day after tomorrow. Keep the pressure on. Reggie gets out of his limo. As long as the cops are occupied down the street, it's a skate, Reggie. The drive-by was good thinking, Max. Wearing crip colors and hitting the kid dressed in bloods keeps the heat on without pointing a finger at us. But no more kids, you understand? It doesn't look good. Sure, you got it, Reggie. If things slack off too much, we hit Elliot again. Green Arrow hides in the rafters above Reggie's office as he enters, just like last time. It's like making love to a beautiful woman. You want to keep the tension as high as you can for as long as possible, but not enough to snap, or it's all over. The beauty of it is that we didn't even have to set up our own operation. Well, when a man like my illustrious predecessor dies, he leaves a sizable gap in the supply chain. The man who fills that gap becomes the strongest link because he has the advantage of knowing how desperately the others need him. All those people in that beautiful network going to waste, looking for someone to use them. Well, that's what we do. 
The part I like best is how the stuff comes in. I think we have Mr. Osborne of the CIA to thank for that one. It's not something even Magnor could arrange on his own. <sighs> Suddenly, Green Arrow is pistol whipped by a guard patrolling the raptors. <clears throat> Likely placed there because of his last visit. Oliver drops his bow and tumbles into unconsciousness. <sighs> <sighs> Back at Sherwood Flores, Dinah wakes with a start. Ah! Uh, Oliver! A note pinned to his pillow reads, Gone to clear the rats out of a warehouse. The Pied Piper. Dinah wakes from a dream of Oliver falling with a terrible feeling that something has gone wrong. Oliver! She stands for a moment, considering... Hmm. Huh. Then sheds her gown and puts on her black canary costume. Z hmm. The canary is a bird of prey. Part 2 In the aftermath of a shooting that erupted three days ago between alleged drug dealers and members of a local block watch association, police remain cautiously optimistic that the violence has ended. However, residents of this troubled neighborhood are less than confident. They've seen this sort of thing before, and they know that the kind of violence which claimed the life of a 15-year-old boy yesterday can erupt without warning. The residents watch and wait with weapons ready for the next attack. It touches all their lives, and, in the end, they are the ones who have to live here and the young girl nervously clutches her doll while watching the large men who wait in the shadows. Dinah goes to Lieutenant Cameron to ask for the police's help in finding Green Arrow. How do you know? I have a feeling. <laughs> well, you have to excuse me, but I need a little more to go on than that. I thought police officers were trained to rely on intuition. Yeah, that's right. Trained. We're not a bunch of amateurs playing dress-up for fun. A cop's instinct is earned. On the street. Where do you think I spend most of my life? Oliver is in trouble, Lieutenant Cameron. I know it. Yeah, well, I gotta kinda figure he had it coming. He rudely shows her the door. Hmm. The young girl watches the street by the warehouses near an emergency phone box. How's it going? Not good. I'm telling you, Reggie, the guy's a stone wall. I tried damn near everything I know. Then try something else. We've got to know what he knows, what he might have heard, and if he had time to pass it on. Nah, he couldn't have. We can't take that chance. We've got a 200-key shipment coming in just after midnight. I want it processed and out of here by dawn. I want him broken. I'll do what I can, Reggie. You'd better do it right. The henchman returns to where Green Arrow's scarred body is chained up and his arrows lie scattered on the floor around him. Eh. Hello, sweetheart. Did you miss me? <sighs> Back at Sherwood Florist, Black Canary paces angrily. Ah, <sighs> damn you, Oliver Queen. I can feel you out there. Where the hell are you? <laughs> After tossing some things around in frustration, Dinah examines Ollie's note and puts it together with the headline in the paper, which reads, Seattle under siege. One dead, three wounded in gang shooting. Local residents claim factory district is drug warehouse. Black Canary arrives in the warehouse district while the police begin to grow worried. They have an agent undercover, Robinson, who's been working for two years to bring the drug smugglers down. The lack of police response in the area has been a purposeful feint to ensure the gang will try to bring in a huge shipment, and then the cops will bust them. Robinson has been out of touch for days, but he was convinced that despite the extra attention due to the violence, the shipment was still coming in. God help us all if this one goes bad. Heh. <laughs> Haven't you heard? God, the spectator. The young girl's fear grows as she watches Black Canary approach some residents hanging out under a streetlight. I'm looking for a man. 
You come to the wrong place, lady. We got kind of a shortage around here. What you saying, fool? I'd be glad to help the lady out. She said, man, boy. Hey, lady, we don't know jack shit. We ain't seen nothing. Somebody always sees. In a neighborhood like this, there's always somebody watching. Yeah, well, they be crazy to talk to you. Lady down the street talked to the TV news and her kid winds up dead. Screw that. We ain't gonna mess with the gangs. So you're just going to let them take over, is that it? Why don't you just give them the keys to your cars, your houses? Maybe then they'll leave you alone. But I wouldn't count on it. If you don't stand up and fight for what's yours, you won't have anything left worth fighting for. The young girl is disappointed as Dinah walks away. Hmm. Ah. No use, Reggie. He ain't gonna break. Then let him hang there till he rots. It's nearly time. I want this place sealed off. Nobody in or out until we're finished. Reggie's men arm themselves and take their positions to watch over the deal. Black Canary goes to James Elliot next. I wish I could help you, Miss Lance, but I've got enough trouble here. You were the first one to take a stand. And damn near the first one to get killed. I'm not afraid to fight for what's mine, but I've got a family to think about. Don't you think what goes on in this neighborhood affects them? They shot at my house, damn it. If you draw the line at your own threshold, you can bet that's where the battle will take place. She leaves his house. Still alone. Hey, lose that. You make a damn fine target all lit up that way. The guard begrudgingly puts out his cigarette as the men on the roof split up. Assholes. Asshole. Dinah chops the guard who warned him in the neck. <gasps> then slams his head into a wall. <clears throat> Black Canary relieves the dead guard of his machine gun and ammo belt. Harris? As another guard comes to investigate, Dinah knocks him out with the butt of her weapon, <laughs> adding his Uzi and hunting knife to her arsenal. <laughs> she breaks a third guard's neck from behind and takes his handgun, <laughs> soon leaving all the bodies piled up as she prepares to enter the warehouse. <sighs> it's time. All right, we do this by the number. What about the meat? No loose ends. Kill him. Get him up. Green Arrow's chained body is raised up to his knees as Dinah's shadow fills a skylight on the roof. <laughs> Chopper's on the way. Time for a little distraction for our friends down the street. Reggie signals the flashy car. Go! It takes off speeding down the street and a cop car turns around to chase it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's been fun, but it's over. You can scream now. It's okay. No one's gonna hear. The henchman readies a gas-powered welding torch. <laughs> no one's gonna care. Oliver! Black Canary crashes through the skylight, and the men all look up. <laughs> she rolls as she lands, avoiding their shots as she does, and coming up with her machine gun ready. Dinah fires, strafing the barrel across all the men in the room. What the hell? Get some men in there. Now! Reggie's crew pull their guns as they run to the other room. Oh shit. Why couldn't this wait? Oliver! Oh god! Please! Dinah frees Oliver and struggles to wake him. Come on! We've got to get out of here! Get up, damn it! You never quit anything in your life! Fight! Dinah? Think I screwed up. She hauls him to his feet just as Reggie's backup arrives. Holy shit! It's that rare bitch! Just then, the undercover agent Robinson makes his move. Police! Freeze! Huh? He is run down by Reggie's car as it speeds out of the warehouse. <laughs> 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 Canary fires into the torch's gas tanks, and they explode. <laughs> Taking out many of the gangsters behind her as she guides Ollie out of the room. 
<sighs> she guns down the thugs ahead of them, carrying Oliver on one shoulder. <laughs> when the gun jams, she hurls the heavy weapon down the stairs ahead, knocking down two more. <laughs> Dinah sets Ollie down as she switches to the Uzi, emptying a clip. Uh, <sighs> don't worry, Oliver. I won't let them hurt you anymore. The last two bullets are for us, but all the rest are theirs. She leaps out into the corridor and shoots another attacker, but more rise up behind him. <laughs> Dinah holds Oliver close for a final goodbye as the men close in on them. <sighs> she readies the handgun. I love you, Oliver. Suddenly, sirens split the night, and the gangsters all panic and run for it. <coughs> Shit! Come! Get the hell out of here! It's all right, lady. You can put the gun down. A fireman gives Dinah a thumbs up. You're lucky. Someone turned in an alarm. Out on the street, the young girl saw the explosion, and she called the fire department from the phone box. Sometimes it takes even the least of us doing what little they can do to save the day. Green Arrow runs away from a door down a hallway, <gasps> only to arrive right back at that same door again. Uh, uh, uh. Oliver puts his back to it, but the door yawns open anyway, releasing ghosts of his torment from his memory. <laughs> <laughs> Broken arrow. He slams the door shut even as he shrinks before it. <laughs> but the door opens again on its own, and a large shadow fills the doorway. <gasps> Dinah turns on the bathroom light and finds Oliver curled up in the shower, lost in his nightmare. Oliver? <sighs> Oliver returns to the office of trauma therapist Annie Green, who helped Dinah after her own experience of being held captive and tortured. A hard thing for anyone to deal with, it can be especially debilitating mentally for those who have chosen to protect others as a way of life. I don't know what this is supposed to prove. It's not supposed to prove anything. It's to help you get in touch with your feelings. My feelings? I'll tell you how I feel. Stomped on, chewed up, and spit out. People who have undergone torture rarely come out of it with only physical injury. Believe me, Mr. Queen. I know. Hmm. While they talk, Oliver has the image of the doorknob fixed in his mind. And? And what? Uh, I want you to tell me how you feel about what they did to you. How should I feel? Pissed off, that's how. That's fine. Anger is a perfectly good emotion. What else? Cheated. Cheated? How? Dinah got them. Finished the whole damn bunch. And you didn't get a chance for revenge. That's right. Not yet. Revenge is hardly ever worth the ultimate cost. Thanks for the warning. Do you think there's someone who still owes you for what they did to you? Ollie rests his hand on an ornate clock. Someone. Somewhere. I heard some interesting things while I was in that place. It's not over. Until you say it is. Damn straight. Why? Because I have a right, damn it! I have a right to some measure of justice! Someone has to pay! They already have. <sighs> it's not the same. Back at home, Dinah examines their bloody and bullet-torn clothing. <sighs> She sheds a tear, remembering her intense feelings during the rescue, her pain at seeing Oliver being hurt, and her grim determination as she paved a way out by dealing a storm of death before them. <coughs> she weeps in the window, remembering the last time she and Oliver talked about having a family. 
I want to have kids, Dinah. I want us to be a family. I was never ready for it or capable of commitment before, but now I... Oliver, I... I don't want to have children. Come on, you love kids. Yes. Well? That's why I'm not going to have any. What we do is important, Oliver, not just to ourselves, but to a whole lot of people who depend on us to hold the line. We're in a deadly, dangerous business. You put your life on the line every time you put on that mask. I love you, Oliver, and I'd love to make babies with you, but I won't make orphans. Uh. Dinah cringes at the memory of her own words, and she clutches Oliver's blood-stained tunic with both hands. Are you angry with Dinah? What? For saving your life. She killed the man who hurt you, and she cheated you out of your revenge. Oliver sinks into a chair. <sighs> and what does that tell you about her? I don't know what you mean. At the very least... It should tell you how she felt that night, when you saved her from the man who was torturing her. He remembered when he found Dinah at the mercy of her tormentor. The pain, the anger, the helplessness, the humiliation. She would rather have died than to have you see her like that. And you know that, don't you? You know what it's like to be stripped of your dignity. To have someone else in total control of your life. Ollie grimaces while in his mind the doorknob remains unmoved. She tried to die. You didn't know that, did you? Huh? She tried, but they wouldn't let her. <sighs> and you know what that's like, don't you? <sighs> he gets up, waving the thought away. I don't want to talk about this. Annie joins Oliver as he stares out the window. You never have spoken of that night, the night you learned you could kill. Nothing to talk about. Nothing? I can deal with it. Perhaps. So far you've done a good job of shutting it out. But sooner or later you're going to have to confront it. Confront what? What you did. Tell me about it. Nothing to tell. Was it a difficult shot? Huh? Ollie looks at her like she's crazy. Ah, uh -huh. I mean, a tricky angle? Small target? A man's heart is the size of a fist. No, not difficult. So you could hit a target of that size every time? Every time. And smaller? Yes. I've read about some of the things you've done. How you shot the knife out of a mugger's hand your first night in Seattle. He remembers that shot. The first real one after practicing with the razor tips. It was perfect, piercing the punk's palm without breaking a bone or nicking an artery, and sent at the perfect speed to stay in the wound, limiting blood loss. It meant he was ready. Was that a difficult shot? No. Then you could have done the same to the man who was torturing Dinah. Annie touches Oliver's heart. But... You didn't. In his mind, he faces the door with trepidation, now on a rocky cliff instead of in a hallway. You shot him through the heart. He deserved it. And worse. In that moment, you chose to kill him, didn't you? Yes, damn it. Even knowing what that would mean, that you could never be the same. Yes. The door opens, and Green Arrow falls into darkness. <laughs> Back at home, Oliver sits in the living room when Dinah comes to him. Oliver, we need to talk. I know this may not be the right time, but I've been thinking about us and about what's happened. How can I say this without sounding horribly selfish? This may be wrong, but I don't think so. I've had a lot of time to think this over, and I realize I almost lost you. And what would I have left? A few scraps of the past? Souvenirs of the places we've been? Things we've done? But nothing lasting? 
These things will all be dust. The doorknob inside begins to turn. Uh. And I thought about what it would be like to grow old without you, without any part of you to hold through the years. Uh. And I've come to a decision. I can't live like this anymore, Oliver. I want to have your child. I want you to plant the seed so I can feel it grow in my body. A piece of you that no one can take away. The door flies wide open, and behind it is Dinah in a wedding dress. <sighs> ah. Oliver sweeps her into his arms, and they kiss. Hmm. Mm. Oliver and Dinah take a stroll through a park. Spring. A season of promise. The old gives way to the new, and the hope which has slept through the long winter awakens. Time for planting the seeds of dreams. Hmm. Aurora Borealis. Twenty-five years too late. Bartholomew Llewellyn. Just for the L of it, Bertha Gertrude. We could call her Bertie Gertie. How about Waldo Oliver? We could call him Wally Ollie. Myrtle? Damien. Oh, sure. They'll want to shave his head and check for sixes. They both see a detective book about Ellery Queen in a store window. Hmm. hmm. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> they return home. Wait a minute. I've got something for you. I should hope so. Dinah holds up Ollie's repaired costume. I just finished it. Would you mind? What? Now? Tell you a secret? It always kind of turns me on. Hmm. I will if you will. He holds up her blonde wig. Robin Loxley Queen. What's wrong with Marianne Fitzwalter Lance? <laughs> hmm. Uh -huh. I see what you mean. They'll think we named her after Woody Fitz Woodpecker. Green Arrow carries Black Canary to their bedroom. What do we call the offspring of this? How about Black Arrow? Already taken. Green Canary? He pulls a strand of blonde hair across her face like a mustache. Fred? She tousles her wig in his face. Ginger? Hmm. hmm. They undress each other as they get into bed. Are you sure? Yes. Oliver and Dinah make love with the intention of making a baby. Afterward, Oliver dresses as Green Arrow. Oliver? What are you doing? Getting back on the horse. Dinah, I thank you. I love you too, Oliver. Mm. He vaults over their balcony, out into the night. Go get him, tiger. Dinah smiles as she rubs her belly. Hmm. Green Arrow comes upon a drug dealer in a firebird. Oh, oh shit. shit! It speeds away as he climbs down the fire escape. <clears throat> and pulls the driver out the top of his convertible. Ah! The car crashes. <laughs> Didn't anyone ever tell you there's a seatbelt law in Washington? My car, man! You wrecked my car! That's nothing compared to what I'm going to do to your face. Unless you tell me where to find Reggie. Man, I don't know no Reggie. <clears throat> Wrong answer. He throws the man to the ground and leaps atop him. <clears throat> <clears throat> Care to try for double jeopardy? Oliver places an apple on another gangster's head like William Tell. You better hold real still. I'm usually pretty good at this, but I haven't been at all well lately. My aim might be a little off. Yeah, I heard how Reggie made you squeal. Shit, that ain't nothing compared to what's gonna... He draws his bow and aims at the apple. Huh? Just then, two police cars arrive. <laughs> 
I heard you were back. You've been leaving a trail of this kind of crap all over town. How's your daughter, Lieutenant? Don't try to play that shit with me, asshole. This is your two-minute warning. Lieutenant Cameron shoves Ollie against the wall. Mm. You and your lady friend screwed up a two-year undercover operation and cost a good cop his life. On top of that, we were this close to putting a lid on one of the biggest drug operations on the coast. Now, we're back to square one. You step out of line again, I'll step on you. Lieutenant, I'm sorry about Officer Robinson. For what it's worth, he saved my life. Hmm. Lousy trade. The cops leave, and then Oliver is hailed by a man near a red sports car. I can give him to you. Eddie fires. I thought you'd have been hung by now. I guess the justice system is more screwed up than I thought. Oh, even worse. Eddie shows Ollie his new badge. D.E.A. Cute. How do you manage it, Fires? Simple. I perform a vital service. You mean a fatal service? In a professional manner. My services are in great demand. Still running with that cute brunette? The one with the... Eh? Ollie grabs his collar. Give me who? Eh? The guy you've been looking for. Reggie Mandel. Back at Sherwood Florist, Oliver packs a bag. Dinah, I've got to leave for a few days. What is it, Oliver? I've never seen you like this. There's something I have to do. Dangerous? No more than driving your delivery truck through rush hour traffic. I'll be back before you know it. Where are you going? I can't tell you that. But with a little luck, you might read about it in the papers. Well, if it's going to be a few days, we'd better get ahead. Dinah pulls him into bed. We need a man we can insert in a remote jungle region to locate a drug processing facility. Someone who can travel fast and light. Eddie brings Ollie to a waiting chopper. This is your pilot, Mr. Smith. Say hello, Mr. Smith. Who can live off the land and avoid detection. To get in and out without a trace. Mr. Smith doesn't say much. Hardly ever. But if he starts talking, you'd better listen. He's your lifeline out there. If you're caught, well, don't get caught. The helicopter takes off. There's a major drug shipment leaving Panama day after tomorrow. The stuff comes in from the jungle and is compressed and encased in an acrylic panel made to look like steel plate. The plates are bolted to the hull of a ship leaving Panama for the United States. Green Arrow jumps out of the chopper. <laughs> we believe the plates are attached while the ship is actually passing through the canal. Just off the continental limit, the ship is stopped for repairs while a diver goes down and pries off the plates. They pick them up by helicopter and fly them straight to the processing location, somewhere in the northwest. He sneaks through the jungle to a compound on the water. If you know all this, why haven't you stopped them before now? We can't stop them if we can't find out which ship the drugs are on. There are hundreds of vessels using the canal. And for all we know, they could pick one at random. What about the military? They've got enough troubles down here as it is. We don't want them in deeper at a time when this country is being scrutinized so closely for any overt acts. So what is it you want me to do? We'll provide you with a tracking device. We want you to insert it in one of the plates so we can pinpoint the ship at every stage of the journey. Ollie slips inside unseen and plants the package in with the drugs, then slips back out again. <laughs> We can follow that shipment right up to the top and smash the bastards once and for all. After we find their headquarters operation, we don't much care what happens to Mandel. Get my drift? Once it is loaded, he watches the boat sail down the river. <laughs> Back in Seattle, Dinah goes to an appointment with an obstetrician. 
It seems you had a severe injury a couple of years ago, which very likely has something to do with this. <laughs> she leaves through the waiting room filled with mothers and children and runs home in tears. <sighs> when do they make the switch? It's going on right now. A team of swimmers attend to the ship underwater while Oliver waits with Eddie. Which one do you think? I don't know. Doesn't make any difference. The trawler is marked. We can pick it up any time. For now, I suggest you go home to that pretty lady and wait. We'll let you know when the stuff comes ashore. Fires, don't try to cut me out of this. Wouldn't dream of it, pal. You're in for the whole ride. You've got my word on it. Better hurry. Your ride's waiting. Ollie gets in a chopper and it takes off to bring him back home. Once he's alone, Eddie pulls out a remote. <sighs> the whole ride. And presses a button. Boop. The package Ollie was told was a tracker suddenly explodes under the waterline. <laughs> Oliver enters his living room. Hi honey, I'm home. Brought your favorite pizza, and some pickles and ice cream for dessert, in case the urge has already hit you. <laughs> huh? What is it, kid? Oliver, I'm sorry. There isn't going to be a baby. Oliver takes her in his arms and looks deep into her eyes. Hmm. hmm. It doesn't matter. He holds her as she cries, <sighs> shedding a tear himself as well. Hmm. I'm sorry. I love you. Sorry. We have each other. That's all that- God damn it! Oliver storms to open the door. A man shoves a badge in his face and he is tackled to the ground. FBI! Hmm? Oliver Queen, you are under arrest for terrorism and sabotage in the bombing and sinking of an American Navy vessel inside the Panama Canal. The end for right now. Sorry for the cliffhanger, but this is the most natural breakpoint I could find for these episodes, and I promise the next one will come along fairly soon. What comes next is a major turning point in the life of Green Arrow in the four-part Black Arrow saga, in which Oliver has run up on false charges, or rather, charges he was duped into participating in. Eddie wasn't really working for the DEA, he is told, and he's now on the hook for a terrorist bombing and an international incident. His bail is denied and his trial is set, but Eddie got him into this, and like any good friend, Eddie gets him out of it when he attacks Oliver's prisoner transport, freeing him. More is going on than Oliver knows, and he's caught up in someone else's game, meant to run like a rabbit as he tries to figure out what's going on and clear his good name. Meanwhile, Dinah makes perhaps the hardest call she's ever had to make and contacts Shado, asking her to come and help Oliver as he's helped her in the past. Shado, who is currently raising her and Oliver's son, whom Oliver does not know about. Shado comes to help as Ollie runs a gauntlet of spies, also visiting Eddie and getting a piece of the puzzle from him. Dinah and Shado meet for the first time, each knowing what the other means to Oliver and the love they both share for him. Dinah expresses her jealousy that as deep as her and Ollie's bond is, she can't share the bond he and Shado do over something so simple as a stick and a piece of string. She also confronts the legacy of the child that she also cannot share with him. Green Arrow goes undercover in black clothing, giving the story its title, as he hunts his way to the heart of the mystery of who set him up and why, and that will be the meat of the story and the first half of the next episode. Afterward, Ollie does indeed clear his name with the government, and he is granted a private audience with then-President George Bush Sr. himself, who doesn't exactly apologize, but he does talk with Oliver as honestly as he is able to, given national concerns, and Oliver's relationship with America and its power structure would be redefined for the rest of his life after this incident and this meeting. The rest of the episode sees Oliver leaving Seattle and Dinah behind and traveling the world, setting off on a grand adventure that will take up much of the rest of the book's run, before he eventually does return to Seattle and settle down again. But he has to find himself a place in the world apart from America, which has so deeply defined him in a way he has never even thought about, and this world-spanning period of adventures broadens his character 
and provides for many entertaining scenarios. First, he goes on a vision quest with a Native American guide. Then, he wanders into a film shoot and ends up serving them as an archery consultant, helping to improve their version of a Rambo-type character. Until killings occur and a mystery ensues, one that perhaps only an itinerant superhero can solve. All this awaits in the next exciting chapter of Mike Grell's Green Arrow. So I do hope you return to see it. Until then, take care out there. And as always, thanks for watching.